I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling it, I'm not feeling it. I need a little more than that, a little more than that. This is huge, huge. My name is Dr. Anton Reese. I continue to have the incredible privilege of serving as president of West Kentucky Community and Technical College. You may have noted uh, as you traverse uh, the outer roads that uh, you may see a sign that says top five in the nation. You know, there are a thousand community and technical colleges across this great land. We've been rated in the top 10 not once, but that's, that's luck. Not twice, that's, that's coincidence. Maybe three times, well, you know things happen in threes. But four times, we might be onto something. But five times, that's a record nationally right here in Paducah, Kentucky. So I use that to warm you up this uh, evening to let you know that we are incredibly proud of what we uh, get to do here on a daily basis, which is to prepare uh, and empower our incredible uh, traditional students coming out of high school to our returning veterans and uh, adult students uh, right here at this college. This is a big year for us. We are celebrating a series of 20s, which would include 20 years as a consolidated college, 25 years celebrating our partnership with the University of Kentucky. But tonight, tonight, we are celebrating the 20th anniversary of our Challenging Learning Center. And so with that, though, I will now bring to the podium our chair of our West Kentucky Community Technical College Board of Directors, Jay Simmons. Give us some more. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reese. It's an honor to be here tonight. It's an honor to see everybody out here. I do bring you greetings on behalf of the West Kentucky uh, College, and we're so glad that everybody is here, and we're so glad that you are celebrating with us. This is a big deal, 20th, 20th anniversary is a big deal for the Challenger Center. Uh, I don't know many of you in here, but I do know that a lot of you in the audience tonight have had a lot to do with the success of this Challenger Center over the past 20 years. So on behalf of the board at WKCTC, I would like to say thank you. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your support. Um, I welcome you, and once again, we're very glad to have you. Uh, as far as what I do, I'm a retired superintendent, and when it comes to education in Western Kentucky and, and beyond Western Kentucky, it is almost impossible to overemphasize the impact the Challenger Learning Center has had on the students of this area. Uh, we talked last night in a, in a little ceremony that we had about how, how much they look forward to coming to the Challenger Center every year. The summer camps, the things that, you know, the things that they do here, it has meant so many, uh, so much to so many, and so many have gone on to be involved in science and industry because of their experiences at the Challenger Learning Center. I know at Carlisle County where I worked, uh, our middle school group looked forward every year. It was a highlight of their year to come to the Challenger Center. And it was, and it was, it was so great. And uh, the board that I represent tonight owes a debt of gratitude to Director Duncan and all those that have kept the Challenger Center not just going but flourishing over these, over these 20 years. It's just been absolutely incredible. So I know the impact it's had on education in this area. I can, I can give firsthand account of all the great things that the Challenger Learning Center has done for the students of Western Kentucky and beyond. So I would like to welcome you here uh, tonight. We are proud to have you. We are honored to have you. We know you're a big part of this. And at this time, I would like to introduce Chris Black. He is the chair of the Paducah Junior College Board, and he would like to bring greetings as well. Chris. What great remarks from Jay Simmons. Um, as he said, my name is Chris Black, and I have the honor of serving as the chair of the Paducah Junior College Foundation. Now, the foundation is a not-for-profit organization that's dedicated to supporting the work of the college, and a portion of the funding for the Junior College Board comes through the municipal governments of McCracken County and the city of Paducah. And a big piece of our outreach from that money is for community activities of which the Challenger Learning Center is one of those, from which I'm sure many of you all have been the beneficiaries. But it's a great honor for the Paducah Junior College Foundation to have been an instrumental part of the Challenger Learning Center landing in Paducah, Kentucky 
for the success that Melissa Duncan and her staff have engendered over two decades of pushing students through, of the importance of the STEM education that the Challenger Learning Center leads to and the proximity of the center to the College of Engineering that the University of Kentucky has placed here as well. All these things working together to grow our community and to create opportunity for people to learn and improve and have great lives going forward. So again, on behalf of the Paducah Junior College Board, I'm pleased to welcome you here this evening, along with Jennifer Horbelt and Colonel Wilcott. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jay and Chris, and thank you for your support of the center over the past several years. We would now like to share with you some highlights of our last 20 years. As you will see, the center has provided STEM learning opportunities and has sparked the imagination of many students and teachers in our community. Thank you to JT Crawford in the WKCT Marketing Department for creating this video. of that small planet, you know, it, it's such a big place here, but being able to look at it from a new perspective, and I hope I can bring that wonder and that excitement back to the students. outstanding learning experience for our students because it's hands-on and because they have STEM activities and they just they learn so much more when they can when they can participate in it. It's one thing to learn about science and space in the classroom but it's an entirely different experience to get to learn about it during a mission. building stuff. Last time I was here I built a space capsule. It takes a lot of work, especially when you have to do it in a certain amount of time. If I wanted to do a science experiment, that'd probably be my favorite places to do. That'd probably be my favorite place to do a science experiment. going to be fun like I'm gonna hate it here but I ended up loving it I ended up wanting to come back I just love it here it's just fun I can learn and but have fun at the same time it's kind of like school but it's not boring very nice there and they get to know you and learn about your strengths and weaknesses and they help you on learning new things. I thought this was a good opportunity to learn about how to become an astronaut and how to learn new things so maybe one day I could work for NASA. We got to go to space and we got to collect moon rocks and explode in here. It was awesome. We even got to put on moon boots. It's awesome because I get to learn about space and different kinds of stuff that are really cool. Kids, if you ever want to go to space, you should come to this place. It's just good to broaden the kids' horizons to know what's out there and possible careers. And we're lucky enough to have Challenger in our backyard throughout the school year and during the summer. And they always come tell me, Miss Shepherd, Miss Shepherd, 
guess what we did at Challenger. Incredible job by our own J.T. Crawford here in our TV department. Now I'd like to introduce our MC for this evening, the legendary WPSD's Jennifer Harbelt. She serves as evening co-anchor for our local NBC affiliate for nearly the last decade. She is now in her 17th year as a broadcast journalist, and most of it right here uh, in our area. During her career, Jennifer interviewed former President Barack Obama, child safety activist, and kidnapping survivor Elizabeth Smart, and The Tonight Show's host, Jimmy Fallon. She's covered extreme weather events like the recent deadly tornadoes that struck our area, the wildfires in Colorado, and the 2017 total solar eclipse. She is most proud of her series, though, Service and Sacrifice. It's allowed her incredible experiences like a flight on a World War II era bomber, but nothing quite compares to the conversations she gets to have with local veterans. Jennifer's journalism experience will help her tonight, but so will her roots. She says as a native of Space City, that be Houston. She was born with a deep appreciation for the stars and our planet's special place among them. Please give a warm welcome to Jennifer Horbell. Thank you, thank you. And thank you for having me tonight. Truly an honor uh, to be here to be asked to do this. The stars at night are big and bright deep in the heart of Texas. Anybody ever heard that? Texans have, <laughs> a lot. Um, that's not exactly true in Houston. Light pollution is really no joke in a metro area of more than 6.7 million people. One of the many reasons I love living here, but the stars were nevertheless a very important part of my childhood. And after all, Houston, as Dr. Reese mentioned, is Space City. NASA's move there in 1961 all but cemented that all things space would be its destiny. My summer breaks were spent riding coasters in the shape of the space shuttle at Six Flags Astro World. I marched with my high school band at the Astro Dome and saw the Astros play there with my dad. A lot of Astro in Houston. Visits to NASA were regular, and while astronaut wasn't in my future, I knew back then I wanted to be a writer, I connected with what it meant to be one. To pioneer, to explore, to push yourself and your species further, maybe than you ever imagined, and beyond. To, as our keynote speaker tonight put it, to our news crew yesterday, fly faster and higher. It is my honor and my privilege to introduce Colonel Terry Wilcutt. Here we go. Not only Kentucky's astronaut, but longtime supporter and friend of the Challenger Learning Center at Paducah. He was born in Russellville, Kentucky. He attended Western Kentucky University, taught two years of high school math before he decided to enter the Marine Corps. And while he was in the Marine Corps, he served as a test pilot, has flown flight hours in more than 30 different aircraft, which is cool in and of itself. He was actually selected for astronaut training by NASA in January of 1990 and officially became an astronaut in 1991. Doesn't end there, folks. He went to space on four different shuttle flights between 1994 and 2000. He eventually became the director Safety and Mission Assurance Directorate. As of December 2021, he is retired, living in Houston, Texas, my native city. Colonel Wilcutt was here for our grand opening, our 10th anniversary, and now our 20th anniversary. We are so blessed to have him back. This is really, really special. Not only Kentucky's only astronaut, but he's here in Paducah tonight. Please join me in welcoming Colonel Wilcutt. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi guys, thanks. Can you hear me okay everywhere? Good. Um, I just want to tell you how much I love this community. That's why I keep coming back. I love your investment in education and things like the Challenger Center. That's, uh, it's nice to be able to be a part of that. And you know, the, the third bullet in the Challenger Center's mission statement is to close the gap between knowledge and the application of that knowledge. When you're in, when you're in college and you're taking you know, your midterm and multivariable calculus, 
it's not unusual to think, what do we do with this stuff? And what we do is, is what, this is the application of that knowledge, where you build rocket ships that go to the moon, take people to Mars, find life elsewhere in the universe. So they, anyway, I love coming back here. I love the mission of this Challenger Center. I love the investments that this community has made. So tonight, what I'm gonna talk about is the shuttle program, my missions, um, what the president, the president gives NASA their marching orders, what the president has asked us to do, how we're doing, and then where we're going. And also I'll talk about life in space. What's it like to, to live up there? <coughs> the shuttle is the most versatile, did I hit that? Let's back up. It's the most versatile uh, spaceship ever made. You know, it can deliver heavy satellites to space, it can recover them, it can build space stations, it does flies laboratories in the payload bay, it does everything. It's got a robotic arm that can reach out and deploy things or grab things, repair things like the Hubble Space Telescope. It's got an airlock to do spacewalks in. No other spaceship has or currently uh, capabilities like that. This is how you get assigned to a, a, space, a space flight. So NASA likes to assign you to your flights one year ahead of time. <coughs> they, they'd really love to do it a year and a half out, but one year is normally the average. So you'd spend that year training for your particular mission. You, uh, you know, learn about the science that you're gonna be doing. You have to learn about all the procedures and emergency procedures in the shuttle. Before the commander can command a mission, because the commander lands the airplane, he has to have 1,000 landings in our shuttle training aircraft. It's a Gulf Stream, it's got a big computer in it. You throw a switch and the flight control system turns into the shuttle's flight control system. It glides down to landing and we have a practice runway out at White Sands, New Mexico. So 1,000 landings uh, for the commander, the pilot who's the backup lander, he has to have 500 landings. So it takes about a year to get all that done. Then one week prior to launch, you've trained all that time, you go into quarantine. The doctors check you out. They don't want you taking any diseases or microbes or bacteria to space. So they check you out and you go into quarantine. Nobody can see you except uh, some significant other and they have to have a physical before they do that. That quarantine is at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. You stay there for three or four days and then you fly down to Kennedy Space Center where you're gonna launch <coughs> and you go into quarantine there too. Again, no one can see you. The night before launch, you get to see your significant other. They go away, you wake up, get suited up. Three hours before liftoff, they put you in the shuttle. So you've got three hours, what do you do? Well, you're strapped in, you throw the switches to get the shuttle ready for liftoff. And you do communication checks, you make sure you can talk to the ground, make sure you can talk to each other. And then you just sit and wait. Six seconds before liftoff, the three main engines light. Each one of those has to work perfectly. So we give the shuttle system six seconds to make sure that each one is operating appropriately. If just one of them doesn't work, you won't make it to space. And so we have a chance to abort the launch and try it again another day. All three engines work six seconds after they light, then they let the solid rockets light. The three main engines give you uh, one million, just over a million pounds of thrust the two solid rockets give you five and a half million pounds of thrust. As soon as the solid rockets light, you're leaving the planet, no matter what you do. And you get two and a half Gs through the chest. So if you weigh 200 pounds with all your gear, it feels like you weigh 500 pounds. If your head with your helmet on it weighs 20 pounds, as soon as they light, your head feels like it weighs 50 pounds. If you have to move your head to look at something, it's, it's quite an experience. If you like catapult shots or High performance dragsters are that hill on roller coasters you'd probably like launch too. How much is six and a half million pounds of thrust? By the time you clear the tower, you're already doing over 100 miles an hour. In 30 seconds, you're supersonic. <coughs> After it takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. After two minutes, all the fuel is burned out of the solid rockets and they're jettisoned off the shuttle. Parachute popped out in the nose. They floated down to the Atlantic. Two ships were in the Atlantic waiting for them to come back. They hauled them back into Kennedy Space Center and refurbished them, reused them for another launch. So after two minutes, these are gone. You ride the rest of the way to space on these three engines and it's smooth as glass. The solid rockets shake the ship violently. If you had to touch this, if you had to push a button, you couldn't do it because your hand would be shaking so much under the solids. You'd have to brace your hand and then reach out and touch that. 
As soon as they're gone, it's, it's a wonderful ride. You don't get to space by launching straight up. You get to space by getting orbital velocity. So we went straight up to clear the tower, and then we roll for the inclination that we want. That's the angle that you make with earthquake, with the equator, rather. And usually it was the east coast of the United States. We would just fly off the east coast of the United States. And then you accelerate, you, you bend over. You, by the way, the shuttle's upside down when it goes to space. You just angle over, and then you go to orbital velocity. That's how you get to orbit. That's 17,500 miles an hour. How fast is that? It's five miles a second. If you fired a bullet, a bullet goes about half, a, it's not, yeah, 17,500 miles an hour, five miles a second. A bullet goes about half a mile a second. So the shuttle at orbital velocity is 10 times faster than a speeding bullet. It's an amazing thing to experience. The, everything is just zipping, zipping by you on the bottom. Anyway, a very nice, comfortable ride. Um, you, get, you turn your rocket ship into an orbiting spacecraft. You take care of your mission, and I'll talk about the missions in a minute. Most missions were 10, 12 days. Some of them were 18 days. I think Columbia was somewhere around 20 days. Um, most of mine were 12 days. The, uh, once you finish the mission, you take your orbiting spacecraft, you turn it into a re-entry vehicle, and you enter the Earth's atmosphere. You're doing 17,500 miles an hour. When you're going to deorbit, we do a deorbit burn. You don't burn down to landing speed. That's orbital velocity, so you just burn a little bit. Now you don't have orbital velocity, so you fall into the Earth's atmosphere. So you do the burn, you pitch the nose around front, to get the heat shield into the atmosphere. And then the friction from the atmosphere is what slows you down to orbital velocity. If you want to land at Kennedy Space Center, you have to burn in a half a world away. You do your deorbit burn over the Indian Ocean, and it takes all that atmosphere and all that friction to slow you down to landing speed. They say it flies like an airplane because it has a stick and a rudder, but it's really a glider. There's no motor. You get one chance to land and one chance only. So you have to manage your energy so you don't have too much energy and you overshoot the runway. You don't have too little energy and you don't make the runway. You touch down about 200 miles an hour. That's faster, like they said, I've flown over 30 airplanes. Nothing landed as fast as the, uh, the space shuttle. That's way faster than military jets or commercial airliners. We had three landing spy spots, uh, Kennedy Space Center, our preferred landing, uh, Edwards Air Force Base out in California, and then White Sands, New Mexico. So both coasts and in the middle. We couldn't fly through bad weather, so and you eventually would run out of supplies. So you only had a couple of days you could delay landing. And having those widely uh, separated landing spots would almost guarantee that you had good weather somewhere that you could come back. By the way, it's not an automatic landing. The shuttle, the commander takes control of the shuttle. When you, so you're supersonic all the way back, losing airspeed, dropping airspeed because of the friction. You get subsonic just when you get over top, on the very top of your landing runway. That's when the commander takes control. Then he flies it from subsonic. We do a descending spiral. You're dropping and you're lining up with the runway and then the commander lands it. This is what it looks like on the inside. That's my second commander. It was designed in the 70s, first flew in the 80s, old cathode ray tubes, 2,000 switches in the shuttle. Uh, and of course, the crew had to know what every one of them did before you launched in space. Here's Joe and sitting in, he's my pilot on my third flight. <coughs> he's sitting in my seat. Every, you know, time in space is very valuable. So every minute is book kept. And this book has what every single crew member is supposed to be doing every single minute. When to eat, when to exercise, when to do this experiment or that or this EVA. Your life is run by that. Of course, you have no gravity, so there's Velcro everywhere. You can see the old green cathode ray troops. Timers, since everything is scheduled, you always have timers going to remind you of the next event. Uh, no GPS. Um, eventually, toward the end of my flying career there, we incorporated GPS as, as an experiment. And then the, after I retired from the astronaut office, we did put GPS in the shuttle. You talk to the computers using a hexadecimal keyboard, the numbers zero through nine, the letters A through F, uh, to talk to it. Old, old technology, but a great spacecraft. 
So you get to space, you're working all the procedures. The mid deck, you know, there's the flight deck that we just looked at, then there's the mid deck. The mid deck had a wall of lockers, <coughs> and this is what the lockers look like. That's where every crew member had their clothes, their food, their experiments, the equipment that they would need, their shaving kit, and it's all color-coded. Um, and any empty locker, we always flew science experiments. What Mike Anderson's working on here is uh, protein crystal growth. Almost every disease that affects humans is caused by a protein or the lack of a protein. Protein crystal growth, we could crystallize proteins. You could do that on Earth, but they were very small. In space, they grew very large in the absence of gravity. You'd bring those back to Earth, they would do something called X-ray crystallography, determine the shape of the protein, then use that for structure-based drug design. Structure-based drug design, design is the fastest, most efficient way to develop new medicines. Matter of fact, the current treatment for HIV, AIDS, it was developed using structure-based drug design. We crystallize proteins associated with that in some of our experiences, experiments, along with if you took the 10 worst diseases that affect humankind, we did experiments looking for cures in those. So every flight had lockers that were uh, devoted to experiments. What else did we do? I wrote some down. Plant growth, you know, part of going to space, it's to make life better on Earth. That's the, the drug research, but also exploration. So plant growth, when we go to Mars, it's a long trip. We'd like to be able to grow some of our vegetables. Uh, we had an aquarium. We had fish and plants and snails in there. You'd like to be able to grow and harvest some of your protein on a long trip to, uh, to Mars. Plus, it was interesting, when we had an aquarium on board, we could see it through this little glass spy scope. It was just a little opening in a locker like that. You could put your eye to it, and you could see the aquarium in the background and the tropical fish swimming by. There's no gravity, so some of them were upside down, some of them were sideways. It, and they say that, you know, if you look in an aquarium, your respiration rate and your heart rate drop. It's relaxing. It was so strange to see my crew members and myself, too. When we'd be floating by, we would stop and, and stare in there and just look at those tropical fish going by. <laughs> it, was, it was a great experiment to have, and unusual to have something that would make you unwind so quickly. Um, a bioreactor, <coughs> if you're gonna work on a cure for cancer and you're culturing cancer cells on Earth, they grow in two dimensions. In space with a bioreactor, they could grow in three dimensions, just like they do in your body. That was preferred by uh, researchers into cancer. We grew uh, cartilage for cartilage replacement, heart tissue for, for heart tissue replacement. Those were all experiments that we did while we were up there. And also something called mechanical granule materials. We looked at the way soil behaves in zero gravity, how it sticks together. You could use that information to improve building codes in earthquake zones. There were other things, extreme temperature furnish, furnace to grow or to develop or make perfect ball bearings that were composite. You would have ceramic and metal matrix ball bearings that would allow, they could take extreme temperatures, so it would allow jet engines and our most modern fighters to burn harder and give our fighter pots more thrust. Lots of, every, again, every locker, we always took something with us to, uh, to work on. This <coughs> was the prototype for the ISS water recovery system. So the space shuttle produce electricity with fuel cells. They combine oxygen, hydrogen across a membrane. It produces electricity, which we powered the shuttle with. It produces heat, which we heated the shuttle with, and it produces water. Water, a cubic yard of water, three by three by three, weighs almost a ton, 2,000 pounds. It's really like 1,700 pounds. Um, it costs $10,000 per pound to take something to space bringing water to space station was gonna be prohibitively expensive. So we have to reclaim water. And we, in this device, the purpose is to reclaim water from your respiration, the moisture in your breath, the sweat when you exercise, and to reclaim water from your urine. So they sent out a survey to the astronaut office that said, how many of you would be willing to drink water from recycled urine from you and your crewmates if we could prove to you that 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 reclaimed water was cleaner than the water in your faucet. I think everybody agreed except one person, and they changed their mind rather than not go to space. So <laughs> it, it, it cost, it cost uh, $1 million just to fly that experiment on, experiment on my flight. If it didn't work, it was important. You could not put humans on space station until this was set up. It would detect impurities. 
and then purify the water and provide the drinking water for astronauts on station. Well, Bonnie, that was her responsibility. Um, so she trains on the procedures. It's critical payload, so she trains on the first level of malfunctions. And then Bonnie, she's such a professional astronaut, she trained deeper into that. Well, we got to space, she went out and she turned it on and it didn't work. One million dollars in the future of humans on the space station at stake. So she got out our in-flight maintenance kit, and uh, which two of us, her and I, were trained to do malfunction, you know, to repair malfunctions that were, could be repaired in space, and also the electrical pin kit. So she opened it up because she was trained to do it at her insistence. She found the problem, she rewired the experiment, closed it back up, turned it on, and it worked. She saved the timeline for putting humans on the space station. Really professional, incredible astronaut. So let's talk about my particular missions. So those were typical mid-deck activities. Uh, my first mission was a space radar lab. <coughs> this is a picture out the back window. This is the robotic arm that Canada furnishes us, the tail, the horizon, the curvature. You can see the curvature of the Earth with that um, part of the wing. And this is the space radar lab, uh, laboratory. So let's talk about maps first. Measurement of air pollution from satellites. When countries sign agreements at the United Nations saying that, that we won't put any more pollution than this in the atmosphere, if you can't measure that, then that signature is worthless. They can just tell you, yeah, we're living up to our agreement. You have no way to measure it. Well, MAPS, the purpose of that was to be able to measure it. To measure it. it could detect carbon in the atmosphere, quantify it, it could tell you how much, and it could tell you where it came from. So that was a huge success, and with that, we put teeth into the agreements that countries sign in the United Nations. The Space Radar Lab, it was an amazing device. It could detect the smallest motions of terrain on Earth. So if the dome of a volcano started to rise, it could tell you that it was rising. And uh, if it collapsed, you could see that. If there was an earthquake, you could give FEMA the a map that showed exactly where the earth had moved and how much. It could measure the amount of water in the snowpack in the Sierra Nevadas and tell Southern California exactly how much water they were going to have that year because they depend on the snowpack to get their water. And so city planners could make plans early. They didn't have to wait till a crisis. They could make plans early. Hey, we need to ration water this year. Same thing with India because they depend on snowpack, of course, from the, the uh, mountains that separate them from China. It can also see below the surface of the earth. If we, you may be familiar with center point irrigation. You, you drill down a pipe into the earth to the water table. Then you pipe it up. You put it on a big horizontal bar that swings around and water comes out and waters crops, center point irrigation. Well, <coughs> you have to, to drill for water. They do this in the Middle East. Of course, water is really scarce. So they drill way down trying to find water. It's hit or miss with the space radar lab. We could look below the surface of the Earth to the terrain that existed at the end of the last, the last ice age. So you could see where an ancient riverbed ran through the Sierra Desert before it was a desert, when it was a tropical rainforest. Every place they had hit water came from that old riverbed, so we could tell them exactly where to find their next well as they exhausted uh, one well after the other. It was an amazing thing, and it worked. We were just flying the prototype, we mapped 9% of the Earth's surface. Uh, the deal was that if it worked, then the U.S. would put it on a satellite so we would have that capability uh, 24 hours every day. It worked so well, they didn't want to wait for that. They asked us to fly it again on another shuttle, which we did somewhere uh, in the late 90s, I think. And uh, they mapped 90% of the Earth's surface. It was a very big success. The second and third missions were to Mir. Uh, we wanted to build a space station and we wanted the Russians to be partners with us. The Russians said, you guys don't know anything about long duration space flight. Remember our flights were only about 12 days. Uh, two weeks was a long flight in the shuttle. They said long duration space flight is different. And so we said, okay, how about letting us fly American astronauts on Mir for six months at a time? You know, we'll pay you to do that. They'll train in Russia with the Russian crew and we'll all take Russian language lessons. You guys take English language lessons. We'll, we'll bring you supplies. So part of it was barter. barter. We'll give you bags of water and uh, science experiments and supplies along with the ones that we bring up for our guy. 
So, um, and why did we want, again, we wanted Russians to be our partners in the International Space Station. That was not guaranteed to happen. And I think it was Lyndon Johnson that said, nations that reach for the stars together aren't likely to start shooting at each other. So this was part of a peace on earth effort. This is part of Mir, and that's, that's orange thing is part of Mir. That's their docking adapter. That's where you actually connect the, the shuttle's docking adapter, which is just below it. Here's a, the, uh, this is the mid deck and the windows. By the way, this is the commander's window during launch and, as, you know, launch and landing. This is the commander's window during rendezvous and docking. You look out this overhead window and out of a back window. Well, this is a tunnel out of our airlock on the mid deck. It goes to right there, and then it, our part of the docking adapter, adapter goes up. The shuttle, it was such a precise flying machine. You closed at about an inch of a second, and you couldn't be more than like a tenth of an inch off laterally. Otherwise, you would hit metal to metal instead of docking and perhaps destroy both spacecraft. I tell people it really wasn't difficult, but it was to do because the shuttle flies so well, but it was a delicate operation. You didn't want to damage the solar rays. You didn't want to misjudge laterally and cause damage to the stations. So that was number two and three. We took up uh, John Blaha and released Janet Lucid. She, she had stayed up for six months doing science and experiments. We brought all the supplies he would need. He brought, we brought stuff the Russians wanted, and we brought down Shannon and her, her biological samples and the test results from the experiments that she did. And then later we took up Dave Wolf and relieved, he re, no, we took up Andy Thomas and he relieved Dave Wolf for their six month stays. That was a very successful program. And by the way, we found out that just like the Russians said, we really didn't know much about long duration space flight. You really have to consider human factors. The very first guy we sent before we started doing this shuttle mirror program, they let us send one guy up there. His name was uh, Norm Thaggard. He's a combat pilot, a test pilot, a medical doctor, and one of the most stoic individuals I'd ever met. He was tough. And I don't mean physically tough, although he was. I mean mentally tough, like a Navy SEAL is tough on the inside. And Norm said, I'll go train in Russia and I'll fly up there. Well, he did that. When he got back, Norm said, I have to tell you, I got lonely. I missed the sound of my own voice. You know, I didn't have anything to do. I felt by myself. <laughs> and since Norm Thaggard, the toughest guy that we knew, was saying that, NASA management decided we need to do something about this, and the Russians let us do it. Um, <coughs> we put uh, on the space station, for instance, we have a, a telephone. Matter of fact, if you're a crew member on the space station, you can call your family every night if you want. Some of them call their barber just to say hello. You know, and they, they call their friends. They, 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 if somebody's having a party, they'll call into the party and talk to everyone. If we're having a party, sometimes they'll call down and just talk to us down there. That, those soft skill sort of things, they become really important when you're up there for six months or a year. And we learned that from the shuttle mirror program and incorporated that into the space station. My fourth, well, anyway, that's the mirror. And this is that orange uh, adapter that where the shuttle attached. It's a progress resupply. On the other side of this are the living quarters. This is the Spectre module. And if you guys ever want to read about space heroism, heroism, this episode, the, the Russians wanted to try to dock a progress without the use of the radar to give you range and range rate during the docking. So they gave the Russian commander on Mir a setup. He lost control of the progress, and he struck Mir. He struck the Spectre module, knocked a hole in it, all the air in the mirror starts leaking out. There's an American on board with the commander. Well, they immediately go to close this hatch just to lose the air out of the spectrum module. They can't close it because they have so many data and electrical cables running through the hatch, it won't close. They just don't have plugs to unplug them there. So they have to grab a hatchet off the wall and they start chopping these. Meanwhile, the alarms are going off, the air's getting thinner. If it gets too thin, then you have just about 10 seconds of useful consciousness and you'll pass out and then you'll die. Uh, so what they have to do before that happens, when it gets too thin, they have to jump to the Soyuz close the hatch, leave the station, and the station will be lost, the Russian space station. Just before they reached that point, they got the last cable cut and closed the hatch. It was a heroic struggle. What's interesting about that also is that the, the Russian ground forces you know, their mission control center, they blamed the commander for doing that. 
um, a hero of the Soviet Union, an old former cosmonaut, one of the original ones, who was an expert in rendezvous and docking. He came in, asked to be put in the simulator and given the same setup. And he decided it can't be done. He couldn't do it five out of five times. He's the world's expert in these things. So he said, the commander's not at fault. You, Mission Control Center in Russia, you messed this up by giving him a setup that can't be done. If you just Google mere progress collision, you can read all about that. By the way, that commander eventually became chief of the cosmonaut office instead of going to Siberia, which he was afraid he was going to, he wound up going, becoming the chief of the astronaut office. That's one of the water bags that we transferred over there, tons of water. That's Valery Korzun, uh, the, the Mir commander on this particular mission. This is the device <coughs> that takes the water that we create with a solar rays and pumps it in there. That's our oven back there. This is our rehydration device. I see a little yellow there, so this is the pilot's shaving kit. There's somebody's jello pudding <laughs> it, it, stuck to the wall. He's a great guy, very Western. He, we, he's one of the cosmonauts that we wish would just leave the cosmonaut office and join our office permanently. Great guy. This is what Mir looked like on the inside. When you're in space and you depend on resupply ships, you never throw anything away. So originally this was really roomy, but since they never threw anything away, this has more room than any other module. The rest of them were so crowded when you floated down the middle, all the hardware bungee corded to the side, bumped off of you, stripped the timers off of you. Very crowded. So my next mission, the fourth one, was to space station. And this is schematic, I only want you to look at, this is the service module or living quarters. It's the same module, it's identical to the one that was on Mir. Because of all the things they kept and all the, how crowded it was on Mir, we wanted a cargo, a, a module strictly for storage. That's what this is. The Russians gave us a functional cargo block uh, for, just for storage. And it attached to a node. And then later, of course, we put in a US lab, a node, a, a European lab and a Japanese lab and built on every one of these pieces was a separate shuttle mission. So my fourth mission, this is all space station look like. That's a progress resupply vehicle. This is the service module. This is that storage closet, the functional car go block. And that's the node that we're gonna dock the shuttle to right there. So we're waiting to get the first crew on board. This is enough hardware for the crew to live on space station. Living quarters, cargo, and uh, a place to dock. So what they asked us to do was if we would go up and turn this empty house into a home. So that was our mission. So we went to Mir, docked here. We put all their clothes, all their food, everything the first crew was gonna need. We installed the gym, the toilet, all the plumbing, the heating, the air conditioning. Um, the batteries that these solar rays power, and, uh, and then, or they charge, uh, the solar rays charge the batteries and the, the batteries charge the, uh, I mean, run the station. Those needed to be replaced because they'd been in storage during development. So we gave them fresh batteries. We also, in their toilet, we put a strip of white across it and said sanitize for your protection. Um, in the sleep stations they had, we put, we slept here first, and in the windows, we put little green aliens uh, in, the, in their windows. Just some humor for the, the crew. You had to be careful because the first commander was a Navy SEAL, and we didn't want to push our luck uh, with him. Okay, so that was, that was my fourth mission. So I'm signed to a fifth, fifth mission. I fly every two years, 94, 96, 98, 2000. I'm assigned in 2002. There's some trouble in the missions ahead of us, so it slips the timeline out. So we wind up getting slipped to May of 2003 instead of 2002. And so what happened in February of 2003, Columbia burned up. So it changed everything. <clears throat> so on my career, what it did was uh, the, pres it, they, the president said, the shuttle's just too dangerous. We built five and you've lost two of them. And so we're gonna use it to finish building the space station. Then you're gonna retire the shuttle. You're gonna let commercial companies bring up cargo and crew, not the shuttle. 
and NASA, you're going to build a rocket to take us back to the moon and then eventually to Mars. So, <clears throat> so we looked at how many flights it would take for us to finish station, and there were two young pilots in the office that were never going to fly a, a shuttle unless uh, myself and a, another gentleman gave up our flights. It was my fifth and his sixth flight. Of course we did. They asked me to go fix the safety community, which was blamed in the Cape report as having a part in the Columbia accident. So I did. So we, I quit flying shuttles and started running the shuttle safety and then the shuttle and ISS safety and then the agency's safety community. We finished building the, the space station. The last one of those, I think, was 2011. And uh, that was the last flight. We retired the shuttle after that. The, the space station that exists now, the first crew moved in in 2000 after we finished my fourth flight. And every day and night for 23 years now, there's been human presence. There's been an American and other humans on the space station 24 hours a day. There's never been a day when we haven't had humans in space. It's bigger than, a, it's got more volume than a six bedroom house. It's bigger than a football field. And it's, it's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize because it did bring the Russians and us together. 18 or 21 nations, I think at the end, have come together to build this station and to do the work, uh, do work in space. So, shuttle was how we retired the shuttle. Now, we don't, how do we get cargo and people up to the space station? Well, fortunately, SpaceX, uh, they had finished their cargo dragon the year before we retired the shuttle. It's what it looks like. And the good news is not only would it take cargo to space, it would bring things down. When you do experiments in space, you need to bring the test results back down to Earth. SpaceX gave us a way to do that with their cargo dragon. And then two years after that, then Northrop Grumman gave us their Cygnus spacecraft. And Cygnus, it brings about 3,000 pounds of supplies up to station, uh, but it doesn't bring anything down. You take everything off, you put your garbage in, you turn it loose, it burns up in the atmosphere coming back. So SpaceX is the only way to get experiment results and malfunctioning equipment back down to Earth to be looked at. What about the people? Well, the only way to get to space was on the Russian spacecraft, the Soyuz. This is a Soyuz. This is the orbital mod module. This is the uh, descent module. I think my batteries are giving out. Do we have another clicker up here? Yeah, here we go. If any of you are colorblind, this won't make any difference. The <laughs> descent module, this is the propulsion module. They're the only way. The Soyuz is the safest human-rated spacecraft ever built including ours. So we were very comfortable doing that. Um, holds three people, commander sits in the middle. It's designed in the 60s, so it looks like a 60s kind of cockpit. Um, got flight, the commander, flight engineer, an American or a tourist. This is what it looks like. By the way, that's Tom Marshburn, an American astronaut, a medical doctor, Russian commander. That's Chris Hatfield, the Canadian astronaut. Not much room in there for supplies. You can maybe get a, some little things with you, but really it's just made to haul people. This is it during entry, and that's the fiery plasma out the window during entry. Again, the safest human-rated spacecraft ever built. So we were, we were happy with this, but one person. It is interesting, the first year, the Russians charged us $25 million for that seat. The next year, it was 35. Next year was 49, 55, 75. The last seat we bought from them was $105 million for a single seat. Our communist friends quickly became capitalists uh, <laughs> when, they had, when they had a monopoly. It comes back under a parachute, lands in Russia. Uh, comes back summer, winter, four seasons, day or night. Very, very reliable. And <clears throat> when you land, they put this little structure over the hatch, pull you up through it, slide you down. And then right off screen, <clears throat> there's a medical tent where our doctors are waiting to get the biological samples and to take new samples from the returning crew member. Every minute they're back in a gravity field, those samples are degrading. So it's important that we get to them right away. 
And we have Americans, American doctors, chief of the office, chief of the astronaut office, are all here for these returns. Then, frankly, we put them in a Gulf Stream, fly them all the way back nonstop, weather permitting, to Houston, Texas, where their family and the, other, the rest of the medical community is waiting for them. So, we paid the Russians all that money more every year until SpaceX finally developed the Crew Dragon. We gave him our launch and entry suit, our orange suits, and Elon said, no way, that's just not sexy enough for me. <laughs> and so he, he developed his own suit. I think he did a good job on that. That looks way better than ours, and, and it works. He met our requirements for that. It's a great spacecraft, very modern. You kind of sit in a recliner. You have touch screens. You know, you don't have to do anything. It launches, it flies itself up the space station. Uh, opens up its nose cone to reveal the docking module. Docks to the station. Crew gets out, goes into the station. If the, it's on autopilot, if something looks wrong, you just touch the touch screen and the computer stops and backs you away from station. You reboot the computer. When everything is set, you push another button and it goes in and does the docking. Very comfortable, very nice, very modern spacecraft. It's turned out to be very reliable too. Uh, our crews love it comes back in the water, like the old days, under four parachutes. The very first time we did this, it was landed in the Gulf of Mexico, and their primary landing site is off the east coast, where KSC is, the east coast of Florida, backup landing sites of the Gulf of Mexico. All these pleasure boulders and boaters in the Gulf of Mexico saw it coming down, so they all ran over to look at it and to see if they could help. That alarmed us, because if the thrusters leak, that's poisonous gas, and they could have been injured or killed. Fortunately, that didn't happen. We thank them. They're just good Americans interested in helping and they're interested in the space program. Now we put out a notice to mariners, you know, warning them, don't get too close. You could get hurt. Put a harness around it, haul it in the ship, put it in this cradle. The crew gets out on the ship. The docks are waiting there for the crew, again, to get the biological samples. And, of course, Elon revolutionized the cost of getting to space by recovering his booster either on KSC property, or if he doesn't have enough gas to make it back to land, he lands on a barge, his barge, out in the Atlantic. That works out really well. But if something ever does happen, the whole SpaceX program will be grounded until we figure out what it was, what cost it, and if it's fixed. So you need a backup way to get to space station. <coughs> and by the way, Congress passed a law that said no more buying seats from Russia. Uh, so SpaceX answered that, and we'd like for Boeing to get up to speed. They were supposed to fly the year before SpaceX, but um, there's no gentle way to say this. They didn't do a very good job, and so their uh, launch was delayed year after year after year. And then when they did launch, they had lots of malfunctions. They were lucky to get their capsule back. Uh, they did get their capsule back. They tried again. Uh, they had stuck valves. They tried again, and they finally got an uncrewed test flight going. Uh, then last fall, they were supposed to fly their first crewed test pilot. They have to launch it, has to go to station and dock, and then stay there for a week or so, then undock and come back and recover the crew. Um, they've, they've had more problems with software, and so that launch is now slipped till July. So July of this year, a handful of months from now, Boeing will give us a backup capability to get to station. Hold seven people or less people and cargo in the slots where you would have had people. Very modern spacecraft, again, all automatic. They use the Atlas rocket. It's the most successful and reliable heavy lift rocket ever built. 100% success rate, so we're very happy with the rocket and we're waiting for Boeing to uh, successfully finish their program. It comes back on land and uses uh, airbags to cushion the the landing. They've demonstrated this three times, worked like a champ, and that's nice to us because it's a land landing, so we can just drive right up, get the crew out, get the science out, and drive away. It's a good thing. Again, we're looking forward to them um, uh, getting online. So I just show this because a company named Sierra Nevada is developing a little space plane. It's beautiful. We love it. They wanted a contract to deliver crew to space station, but we told them their development timeline didn't fit with ours, but we gave them a contract to develop it for cargo. <coughs> so they 
on their own dime, they're finishing development, they've already drop tested this, it lands itself on the runway, you don't have to fly, it's all automatic, holds seven people or less people in cargo, and uh, we're, we're waiting for it. Very successful, they just have to finish up their testing. In 2028 or 2030, 2030 we hope, uh, the space station will be retired. There will be a commercial space station then, run by a commercial company called Axiom. Sierra Nevada, if they come online, they'll go to space station, but after space station is gone, they will bring people and cargo to the commercial space station, and that's gonna be run by Axiom Corporation, based out of Houston, Texas. So, the president said, you're gonna finish space station, you're gonna turn over low Earth orbit for commercial entities, we've done that, and now you're gonna get ready to go back to the moon. So, we developed the most powerful rocket ever made, uh, the space launch system. Shuttle gave you six and a half million pounds of thrust. This gives you over nine million pounds of thrust. When the shuttle launched, if it was at night, it looked like the sun came up again. Even during the day, the ground shook, the building shook, glass vibrated. You could feel the vibrations in your chest. Grown people and kids cried sometimes during a shuttle launch. You just got to get down and see this thing go. It's going to be spectacular. Uh, we've launched it one time. That was on Artemis 1. By the way, this is the Orion capsule, deep space capsule. Apollo had three people and 12 feet across, four feet in diameter for each person. <coughs> this holds four people, 16 feet across, the same amount of space as Apollo had. So last November, we launched Artemis 1 in the, uh, in, uh, the first launch in the Back to the Moon series. What they did was they launched out of Kennedy Space Center, they orbited the Earth, went out to the moon, did a few laps around the moon, and then came home. We were testing the guidance, the targeting, so if you told it to burn to this point, did it actually send you there, or did it send you someplace else? Was the guidance and targeting accurate? And of course, all the rocket systems and capsule systems. There were no life support systems on Artemis One. A lot of those things could have failed, and we would have declared that mission a success as long as the heat shield worked. We tested everything that I just talked about on the ground, confident that it worked. The heat shield, we have no facility that will test a heat shield that big. During shuttle, 17,500 miles an hour, you saw 3,000 degrees on the heat shield. Coming back from the moon at lunar velocities, it's 5,000 degrees. So the only test of that heat shield was Artemis I. It worked fine. It's good to go for Artemis II. There, were, there was an anomaly with it, They've looked at it and they've declared it good to go. Some chunks came off. It has an ablator, so the heat shield actually melts and takes away the heat as the liquid uh, spills off the sides. There were some lumps, they think, due to uh, bubbles in the ablator when they put it on. They have to ensure that that's done and then see what's wrong with their technique of applying the, bla of the ablator to, that you're getting bubbles in it. But I just talked to the program manager for the Artemis missions, and he said that they've determined the heat shield is good to go. So, Artemis II, first people, first launch of people back to the moon for 50 years. Artemis II is a test of the human life support systems and, the, and a second test of the heat shield and, of course, the targeting. They launch from Earth. They spend two days just orbiting near the Earth, checking out the life support systems and the targeting. If everything's working the way it should, then we'll do a tr translunar injection burn, and it'll take four days to get to the moon. They're just gonna circle the moon, not even a complete circle, then take four days to come back and land in the Pacific Ocean off the coast, coast of California. That's Artemis II. Again, life support systems and uh, a second test of the heat shield. That's November of next year, so about a year and a half. One year after that, December of 2025, is Artemis III boots on the ground, on the moon. We launch from KSC, circle the Earth, quick check of the life support systems, go to the moon, enter what's called a near rectilinear halo orbit of the moon. What does that mean? Well, rectilinear, the moon orbits the Earth this way. Our orbit is kind of the trailing, trailing the moon around its orbit. That orbit uses very little fuel to maintain the orbit. And since you've got part of the crew in the Orion capsule, you want them to be able to use as little fuel as possible maintaining their orbit. 
it's a halo orbit. If this is the moon, this is the ship. Remember in the old days when the, the capsule went on the back side of the moon, you lost calm with it till it popped out on the other side. In a halo orbit, you never lose contact with the Earth, so you have constant communication. So the crew will enter this orbit, they will rendezvous with the lander, two of the crew members will climb into the lander, they will descend to the surface, the other two will stay in Orion in this orbit. The crew on the ground will stay on the ground about, about a week, six and a half days. Then they launch in the lander back into this orbit, they rendezvous with the lander, everybody gets into Orion again. Then they depart, one more pass, and then come back in. Total mission time is about 30 days. So the first one was 28 days, 25 days, Orion 2 is 10 days, Orion 3 boots on the ground will be about 30 days with a month, I mean uh, one week on the surface. There is an Orion 4, it's a repeat of Orion 3, putting more infrastructure on the lunar surface so you can stay longer. Orion 5, this by the way, that's the lander, it's giant. Those are people on that little platform they get the hatch open, and then they come down with cables to the lunar surface. SpaceX is building that. Matter of fact, this week they hope to test uh, orbiting the Earth in it. They, I think they've had a, a problem with a cryo valve that was stuck during the launch attempt. So that'll be Orion 3 and 4 will use their lander. And where are they going? Uh, they're going to the south pole of the moon. And why, the, <coughs> why is that? Because it's scientifically interesting to us. And a lot of the moon has two weeks of light and two weeks of dark. You don't want to go up there and spend two weeks in the dark. So if you land on this Malapert uh, high ground right here, 90% of the time you're in the light. So we'll, we'll land there. And these craters are interesting to us because we're learning to live on another solar body. <coughs> and this is another sensor that shows that there's water embedded in the soil in all these craters. We'd like to know if we can mine that water purify it and drink it, if we can mine that water, purify it, split it into oxygen and hydrogen, oxygen to breathe and hydrogen to use for fuel, rocket fuel. So this is all part of, um, again, learning to live on another planetary body. <coughs> and also, this is geologically interesting because there's valuable minerals uh, scattered and embedded in the lunar soil, including helium-3, which could be used to build a fusion reactor for clean nuclear power here on Earth. So this is, if you want to stay longer than just a week on the surface, then you have to put a space station around the moon. And so the Artemis V will have a space station, it's called Gateway. Ryan will dock with a space station. Everybody will get into the space station. Then the crew going to the surface will climb into land or go to the surface. They can spend a month on the surface. The crew is not just stuck with the supplies they have on Orion. They have an entire space station to live on before the crew finishes. They come back up to Gateway. Everybody gets in Orion and returns home. So that's, that's the plan. So what happens when you get to space? So the president, remember, the president asked us, you know, finish this station, turn over low Earth orbit to commercial entities, get ready to go back to the moon. That's what we're doing. And within about two and a half years, we'll have boots on the moon. Um, what about living up there? If you ask me right now, hey, Terry, carry this podium to the back, and I would have trouble doing that. I'd be grunting, groaning, asking for people to help me. If we're in space, I would just literally pick it up with two fingers, give it a little push, and somebody down there would, would catch it or up there. There's no work. Nothing weighs anything. I mean, it's so, all your muscles start to atrophy. You know, they disappear, your aerobic capacity goes away. So we have, matter of fact, the early shuttle launches, just from that couple weeks or 10 days in space, the doctors didn't know if they could actually run away from the, if there's a shuttle emergency on the landing strip, they didn't know if they could run away from the, the crash site because they were so weak. So they gave us a treadmill. This is on space station, it's just like an earth treadmill except you've got bungee cords so you don't float off. You've got an exercise bike if you don't like the treadmill, and you can strap yourself to a seat or just hang on to the structure behind. So that takes care of the aerobic capacity and the muscle atrophy, and that works well. You also, you have a skeletal structure to support yourself in a gravity field. When you don't have a skeletal structure, if you're bedridden, what's your body do? It starts dumping all the calcium out of your bones. 
that happens in space because nothing weighs anything. So they had to give us a uh, air piston weightlifting machine. Of course, weights don't weigh anything, so they don't do any good. But with these air pistons, you can do the heavy exercises like deadlifts, squats, bench presses, to put stress on your skeleton to tell it you still need the calcium in my bones. Those things have worked. Those were big problems, and you couldn't send somebody to Mars because when they got to Mars, they wouldn't be able to function. They have solved that with these countermeasures. Food. This is shuttle food. We use the same thing on space station. We get these from the military. Meals ready to eat. These are really M&Ms, but we're supposed to call them candy-coated peanuts. <laughs> Shortbread, cheese spread, crackers, cream spinach, silverware, magnets to hold your silverware. That's a beef steak, it says. When you get to space, the fluid shifts to your head. It kind of feels like you have a cold, and so food tastes bland. So everyone's favorite food is like Italian food, spaghetti, ravioli, uh, lasagna. Uh, those all come in these meals ready to eat also. <coughs> Cream spinach. So before you go to space, you go to the food lab. They have 100 things, and you sample every one of them. You rate them from 1 to 10. 1 means you would never eat it, and 10 means you love it, and would you like more right then. You make up your own menus. You give them to a nutritionist. She gives you a balanced diet by putting things like that on there. But you don't have to eat it. She's not there when you get to space. So it, it all works out well. The drinks, we rehydrate our food still. We don't launch water to space. It costs too much, weighs too much. Drinking water, you know, you can get hot or cold water. Kona coffee, it's delicious, very smooth coffee. Tea, lemon, plain tea, hot tea, lemon and sugar, whatever you want. Uh, chocolate breakfast drink, if you like that, strawberry drink, orange grapefruit drink. Oh, well, I'll tell you that some other time. It was a, it's a great story, though. The, the, this is the kitchen in the service module. So this is the living quarters on Space Station. This is the table. If you see cans, that's Russian food. Does it taste good? If you like Russian food. I lived in Russia for seven months as the director of ops in Russia. I eat Russian food. It's a little heavy, a little greasy. I think for most American diets, but the Russians like it, it's okay. <coughs> this food tastes just like that. So it's not like, oh man, these cans are horrible. No, they taste like Russian food, it's okay. It's like being on a ship in the Navy, you don't mess with the food or the mail. So the Russians like their food and we like ours. On either side of this table, these are the living quarters. This is, uh, it's about the size of a phone booth. The commander lives here, you can see up, he's got the door open, here's his shoes. Uh, flight procedures, some picture, his knee board. He can close this door at night, and turn out the lights. It's a very comfortable uh, sleeping quarter. Same thing for the Russian pilot over here. Here's Susan getting food for a meal. Here's the table again. This is, I think this says uh, uh, meat or something. This, she's uh, got a vegetable tray out of the pantry right back here. So she's obviously looking for something to give her a complete meal here. And did I mention that every day is a bad hair day in, <laughs> in space? The, here we go. Here's Ed and Yuri sitting at the table. They've got their feet in foot restraints so they don't float off. Here's the plastic wear or silverware Velcroed to the side. Yuri's got a pair of scissors to open things up for Ed. And they either switched food or it's just floating out of control while they're in there. Because this is Russian food. It can't. That's Ed's stuff. You can't have salt and pepper. Things taste bland. But if you put salt and pepper, that stuff will float and get in your eyes or in your nose or mouth. So we have liquid salt, liquid pepper. You want spicy stuff, barbecue sauce, soy sauce. Uh, these tubes of food. I'm not certain what's in those, but I would suspect it's things like mustard you know, things that you would want in a tube. Um, the food is pretty good. Meal time's important. It's one of the things the Russian told us. Everybody's busy. Every minute is book cap in there. It's important for the crew to eat together around the table for meals and keep the camaraderie going. So uh, always in the space station, the crew has their meals together. Sleeping. So the American, you know, the Russians have those two sleep stations. The Americans have four sleep stations, size of a phone booth. They're in one of the modules. If you have more than four people on board, four Americans, then you just Velcro your sleeping bag anywhere and go to sleep. What's it like to sleep in space? 
I tell people, imagine a mattress so soft it feels like you're floating on a cloud or sleeping on a cloud. It's great if you get cold. <coughs> then you just bring your arms in, put that hood up. If you have light leaking in, that would bother you to put a mask on. You sleep very well up there. The toilet. Everybody wants to know about the toilet. The, it looks like an earth toilet, except you've got these bars here that you, they have springs, you pull them up, move them across your thighs, and they keep you from floating off the toilet while you're doing your business. The, these funnels, Everybody has their own funnel, that's for number one. And they're stored over here, wet wipes, et cetera. So, and these are the foot restraints to keep you in position also. It's like an earth toilet. The one on space stations like this only, it's much smaller. They manage between the original shuttle toilet and the space station toilet, same function, same facilities, just smaller. So we have finished station, we're doing science on station. We're going back to the moon. Our next thing is to go to Mars. That was the last thing on the list. So in the late 2030s, we'll be going to Mars. Um, I wanted to show you where we're going to land on Mars and why we're going to land there. This is the Jezero crater on Mars. Three and a half billion years ago, Mars was a warm, wet planet, just like Earth was a warm, wet planet. They had an atmosphere. That was three and a half billion years ago was when microbes developed on Earth. There's no reason to think that microbial life would not have developed on Mars at that time. The floor of this, you can see right here, a Martian river carved out a riverbed in the Martian soil and dumped into this vast lake in Jezero Crater. The flow of water was so vigorous, there's large boulders that were moved down along with this flowing water into the crater. The six chemical elements that are essential for life are all in this crater. We've already checked that. Right now, the Perseverance uh, rover, it landed right here, by the way, is taking core samples in this. And you can see the, the dan from the river uh, delta right here, um, the fan, rather. So it's taking core samples in this crater. It's stashing them off to the side the Europeans are right now building the launch craft that's going to land, pick up that stash of core samples, and launch it in, out of Mars into the Martian orbit. We're building a spacecraft that will be orbiting Mars. We will approach that spacecraft. We'll capture the spacecraft. Then we're going to carry everything back to Earth. We're going to take those core samples and look to see if we find microbial life or signs that microbial life did exist. One of NASA's big charges is to determine if life exists someplace else in the universe. This is part of the, that mission right here. So that's where we're going, Jezero Crater. It's 25 miles across, 800 feet deep, and it's an ancient Martian lake. If we're gonna find life, that's why this was selected. We think it would have existed right there. So what's next? Well, last week, I think it was, we announced the four crew members that are going <coughs> to circle the moon on Artemis II. They're four of uh, the nicest, most capable people I know. So I think they did a good job selecting. And folks, that's everything I've got for your presentation. Why, if we have time for questions, I will be glad to take some. Thank you, oh, you're so welcome. You wanna, you wanna talk yeah. in this? Maybe one question, one or two questions each, uh, answered very quickly, and then um, we'll head over. I'll give you directions soon to head over to the Challenger Center to uh, get your picture, get an autograph, and meet uh, Colonel Wilcott. If you don't get to ask a question here, you can ask him there. So, uh, Dr. Reese and uh, Jennifer, do you guys want to grab a mic? There's, there's one down there also. It does appear to be working. Anybody got a question? You can I end up pretty quick, young can man. I ask, can I ask the first question while you're going there? Absolutely. Um, people want to know, did you see any aliens while you're in space? I want to know that. Okay. Well, <laughs> I warned people, and my crew will back me up. I always tell the truth, always. And yes, we did see aliens in space. I flew with two Russians. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 
like a dad slash astronaut joke. Very good. We've got a question from a young man right here, sir. Um, tell us your name real quick. Taylor. Okay, and how old are you? Ten. Ten years old. What question do you have for Colonel Wilcutt? Um, is that Jizro like, crater, is it close to Olympus Mons? N that's Good a great question. question. You know, I, I couldn't, I don't believe it is, uh, but I would have to check. That's easy to check just by Googling a Martian map. And uh, you should, but I don't believe that it is. I think, isn't Olympus Mons in the northern hemisphere of Mars? I don't think this is. The northern hemisphere was once covered, a third of it was covered with really a vast ocean. And of course, Olympus, Olympus Mons is the largest volcano in the solar system. That's a good question. I don't think it's close, but I would have to check. Thank you. Got a question here from Ryder. What was your favorite mission? My favorite mission? You know, it's kind of like your children. They're all your favorites. <laughs> but the, and I really did, I had super crews on all my, but, and you know, I wanted to work, I wanted to go to space station, I got to do that, I wanted to go to Mir, I got to live in Russia, uh, all those things. But my best friend in my test pot school class was a guy named Joe Edwards. And after we, you know, we went to test pot school, then we served as test pots for four years or four and a half years. I came to NASA and Joe went back to the fleet and flew F-14s, uh, an incredible pilot and test pot. <coughs> and, um, then four years later, we're selecting another astronaut class, and Joe applies, and, and sure enough, he's selected, he gets into the astronaut office. And then as luck would have it, we got assigned to the same mission. I was the commander, and he was my pilot. So going to space with, really, my best friend from my test pilot days was just a thrill. It's a shared memory we have. By the way, he was an unbelievable pilot. I just, hopefully I have time, one minute to tell the story. He took a cat shot in his F-14. He's accelerating out in full afterburner, going through supersonic. The nose cone off of his F-14 comes off and crashes into the windshield, knocks a hole and puts cracks, spider cracks through the whole windshield. Debris comes in through the hole, gets under his mask, blinds him in one eye, and detaches the retina and his blood and he's blind. So he's got one eye, he can't see out the canopy. He's got one little hole that he can look through to see things, all his pedal static instruments are gone because the instrumentation was in the nose of the airplane. Joe, he flew it back to the carrier and landed it on the carrier uh, with one eye looking through a hole. They asked his backseater, why didn't you eject? And he said, well, I was fine with Joe Edwards. I, th I felt like he could handle it. <laughs> the, admiral, the admiral that was on board the ship, uh, and they have pictures of his F-14 flying with the gear down and no radar. The Admiral said in his 35 years of aviation experience, he'd never seen anything so remarkable as what he did. That was just Joe Edwards. And to be able to fly a mission with him in space, that was, you know, it's a memory that we, when we see each other, we tease each other about, you know, who was really the best spider pilot. But <laughs> that's it. It was a great thing. So that would probably be my favorite. We've got another one here from a young lady. Uh, tell us your name. Lisa. And how old are you? Seven. What is your question for Colonel Wilcutt? Um, how does a place where the spaceship take off n not start on fire when it takes off? How does it not set on fire when it takes off? <coughs> because we're accelerating, so it keeps all the flames behind us. Uh, and that's really, as we're going forward, the wind around the ship and the rocket, it's pushing all those flames behind us. That's, that's what keeps us safe. And then when they burn out of fuel, that flame goes out, and then we get rid of them. So just the aerodynamics keeps that flame away from us. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel Wilcott. Let's give him oh, another round. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, you mm -hmm. Oh, that's yours. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to whisk him away to the center. Um, I just want to say some thank yous. Uh, for cel uh, to you all for celebrating this milestone uh, with us this week, and to my uh, oh sorry that's okay I keep talking. he's got to get his fun things here. Gosh, you're a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.
Th um, thanks to our CLC staff. I want to personally thank you for all that you do to make our center a success. And we're wearing the denim shirts. So anybody in a denim shirt works at the Challenger Center. So say thank you to them on your way out. Um, also, thanks to many of our WKCTC employees, the marketing office, for helping us over the past several months as we prepared for the events, our maintenance and operations staff for all the assistance, the Clem Clemens Fine Arts Center for help in tonight's presentation, and to everyone on the committee, a big thank you for your assistance uh, for this great celebration. Um, thank you to you for coming to hear Colonel Wilcott speak, but the fun isn't over yet. Please join us at the Challenger Learning Center for an open house where you can meet Colonel Wilcup. You can get his autograph. We have these really cool NASA pictures. All You can get it signed and enjoy moon pies because everybody loves a good moon pie. We have different flavors. Uh, moon pies and two are our simulator if you've never seen the center. So when you exit the theater, you will actually go out the opposite doors of that, that you came in from the parking lot. We'll have staff along the way. The center's just right down the sidewalk and um, you'll go into the front lobby and you'll be able to meet Colonel Wilcott. So please join us, um, come uh, see him and, and thank him for what you learned tonight. Thank you again and have a wonderful evening.